Tonight, Vodafone's secret wiretaps are no longer secret. That Apple Watch might have a real launch date, and the CIA loves social media. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 103 for Friday, June 6th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by Full Sail University. Full Sail offers both online and campus degree programs centered on real-world experience in the entertainment, media, and technology industries. For more information, visit fullsail.edu slash TN2. I'm Jason Howell. Let's get right to the tech feed. Uber Technologies has just raised $1.2 billion in a fundraising round that values the four-year-old startup at $17 billion, which is a record for a technology startup in a direct investment round. But that doesn't mean it's smooth sailing from here. The state of Virginia has sent a cease and desist to Uber and competitor ride-sharing service Lyft to halt operations after finding the company's over $35,000 in civil penalties earlier this year for operating without proper permits. However, officials at both companies said they will continue to operate in the state. In neighboring Maryland, Uber is currently appealing a decision by the state's chief public utility law judge that it must file an application to operate as a for-hire carrier. Mobile phone provider Vodafone has admitted the existence of secret wires that allow government agencies to listen to conversations on its networks in at least some of the 29 countries in which it operates in Europe and elsewhere. The company is spilling the beans on government surveillance in an effort to raise awareness about widespread use of phone and broadband networks to spy on citizens as part of its first law enforcement disclosure report, which details how governments monitor the conversations and whereabouts of citizens. Vodafone says wires have been connected directly to its network and those of other telecom groups, allowing agencies to listen to or record live conversations and track the whereabouts of a customer. But in about six of the countries in which Vodafone operates, the law either makes it mandatory for telecom operators to install direct access pipes or allows governments to do so. Vodafone has not named the specific countries involved because certain regimes could retaliate by imprisoning its staff. For example, in Albania, Egypt, Hungary, India, Malta, Qatar, Romania, uh, South Africa, and Turkey, it is unlawful to disclose any information related to wiretapping or interception of the content of phone calls and messages, including whether such capabilities exist. Earlier this year, Yahoo announced plans to phase out Google and Facebook-based sign-in from its services. Now, the company is making good on its promise and has emailed users of its photo service Flickr that group, uh, sorry, that Google and Facebook IDs will no longer be accepted there after June 30th. Instead, Flickr users must create a Yahoo account if they don't have one already and connect it to the photo uh, storage site. Flickr turned on the third-party login feature three years ago to widen user numbers, but Yahoo CEO Marissa Meyer is reversing that approach. If Flickr's popularity maintains or grows, forcing a Yahoo account would help boost Yahoo's own user base across its other properties that cover sports, weather, and news. The New York Post is reporting that Google is in talks to acquire six-year-old music curation and streaming service Songza, citing two anonymous sources. Songza competes with internet music services like Pandora and Spotify. Now, Songza CEO Elias Roman said he couldn't comment, and Google declined comment, of course, uh, so hard to say how much weight this rumor has, but let's talk about something Google is definitely doing here, uh, letting its users explore their creative side in Google Hangouts. It's kind of cool. And an update to its web interface rolling out to users today, Hangouts will now let you send sketches to your Hangout contacts in chats by hovering over the camera icon, which will then reveal a pencil button that launches the new tool. No word yet on the feature coming to Hangouts mobile apps. I know I'm looking forward to it. That'd be kind of fun, like Pictionary in chat. Still to come, guess who's officially joined the Twitter party? I'll give you a hint. They're very intelligent. And after the break, Reed writes, David Hamilton weighs in on Apple's moves towards social search and maybe possibly a real date for that iWatch. But first, let's thank Full Sail University for sponsoring this episode 
of TN2. Marketers need to know how to use advanced web-based tools and know the right techniques to reach audiences and consumers digitally. Online marketing elements such as web-based channels, search technologies, and analytics drive today's advertising and branding strategies. Full Sail University's online internet marketing master's degree program is designed for professionals who will keep pace with these marketing technologies. Courses like search engine optimization, social media marketing, web metrics analytics, and online consumer behavior. Students work on real projects with real clients to gain experience and generate results and learn from industry experienced instructors. Full Sail University's online and campus degree programs focus on real world education and experience uh, with industry tech and also workflow. It's an innovative curriculum. And here's the best part. Earn your master's degree in 12 months. Along with internet marketing, Full Sail offers a variety of master's degrees in related fields, including business intelligence, innovation and entrepreneurship and new media journalism. To learn more about Full Sail's master degree program in internet marketing or any of their related programs, check out fullsail.edu slash TN2. That's fullsail.edu slash TN2. And we thank Full Sail University for their support of Tech News Tonight. All right, I want to welcome to the show David Hamilton, Senior Editor at ReadWrite. Welcome, David. Hi, Jason. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. It's good to have you here. So let's talk a little bit about Apple. It's kind of an Apple hodgepodge, a basket of apples, because uh, we have a bunch of uh, little Apple stories that have popped up in the last few days. First up, uh, <laughs> we've been waiting forever for solid news about Apple's rumored entrance into the wearable market. Uh, today, a few outlets are pointing toward a date that we can finally look forward to, put it on the calendar potentially. Um, is it likely that we'll get a chance to meet this device toward the end of the year? Well, this is probably the best indication of a launch date we've gotten so far. Uh, that's just not saying very much. I mean, publications <laughs> all over the place have been sort of breathlessly anticipating an iWatch for, you know, a year and a half, maybe two years in some cases. Um, nothing has materialized yet. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it's, it's worth noting the story basically broke in a, in a Japanese business publication that's really well known in Japan for floating rumors. So um, I think this one has been confirmed supposedly in sort of a hedged fashion sure. by other American outlets. So yes, maybe, um, <laughs> but it would be still very cautious to say, of course, Apple could change its mind. Yeah. Uh, it's a nice way of saying nobody really knows. So don't hold your breath. An iWatch isn't worth turning blue and falling over. <laughs> Cool. So this is just like all the other rumors. Although I think Recode also has their, have their own sources that are kind of pointing to something similar at this point. And I think the date was, uh, well, it's not really a date. It's more of a month, October, uh, and it's with and an event. Change its mind. And yeah. so take that for what it's worth. Sure. We might see it in October. We might not. Yeah, well, uh, I know a lot of people hope that we do. Did anything stand out to you from this week's WWDC presentation that might point toward laying the groundwork for this kind of a device, would you say? Well, lots of people were looking for clues sure. that Apple would be moving its way toward an iWatch, laying the groundwork for it. Um, and there there really actually was sort of a dearth of information. Uh, the closest thing that you could point to would be Apple's introduction of um, HealthKit, which is sort of a, a back-end set of APIs for developers to um, incorporate health information into a new app that Apple is also releasing called Health. Um, it's going to take in a lot of health information, uh, everything ranging from uh, supposedly blood pressure and pulse and uh, possibly your dietary habits, your sleep cycles, etc. And okay, so that's an indication that if the iWatch comes out and it is laden with sensors and, um, you know, a kind of a fascinating new um, user interface, which is more or less what people expect from Apple, um, it's going to collect a lot of medical information about you, uh, which Again, opinions may vary on this. That doesn't strike me as like the most exciting reason you would want an iWatch from Apple. Mm -hmm. um, it, it sort of brings to mind the fact, I guess Apple was founded in 1976, right? So companies in its late 30s, seeing the big 4.0 coming up. It's in middle age. And what do you do when you get middle aged? You start thinking a little more about your health. You watch what you eat, you try to exercise more, you go to the doctor, you end up with some additional prescriptions. All right, health and health kit strike me as sort of an Apple middle-aged answer to what consumers want from a from a wearable. And I just don't know that that's going to be the best selling point they could possibly come up with. Right. Uh, that's, an, that's a very interesting analogy. I know what a lot of other people also do when they have 40, they buy a Ferrari. Uh, 
So I wonder what Apple's uh, answer to the Ferrari would be in this uh, analogy. I like it, though. Uh, on the mobile side, it sounds like Apple's readying a new strategy for how it sells its unlocked iPhones through its own brick-and-mortar outlets by offering to set up the devices with prepaid and monthly plans in-store, meaning the customer doesn't have to bring their device that they purchase there into a carrier store to then activate it after purchase. Uh, David, is this an attempt to clear out inventory ahead of a new product push? Do you think maybe it's just a clear next step in Apple's attempt to keep customers in the store buying more products, potentially an iWatch at some point? Yeah, well, I definitely think it's the, the latter that you just mentioned. Sure. Um, it's also very much on par with what Apple has historically done with the iPhone, which is to steadily sort of cut carriers out of the picture, okay? They launched with AT&T and became, I mean, they, they really um, set the pace for, for smartphones in the sense that they, they barred AT&T from loading the phone with bloatware. I mean, Apple said, this is our device. We're gonna put what we want on it. AT&T, you take it or leave it. AT&T took it and the rest is history. All right, in this case, what they're doing is moving toward a scenario where they cut the carriers out of the activation business in a sense. I mean, the carriers obviously still do the activation but they're not pulling consumers into their stores. Instead, they're going to be in Apple stores. There's going to be a whole array of other stuff for them to look at, to get excited about. Um, so in that sense, it's very smart. Uh, they're also, uh, for the first time, allowing people in the, in the U.S. to buy uh, iPhones for their actual retail price. Normally, you get a subsidized phone and have to pay for a, sign up for a two-year contract. So these are contract-free plans, similar to what uh, Apple and other carriers offer in Europe and elsewhere. Um, and in a way, they're also this, this is also Apple sort of catching up with the U.S. market because the carriers themselves have been moving toward these sorts of plans to give consumers some more flexibility and possibly some cost savings. Mm -hmm. So in, in a way, it's it's a it's a two for maybe a three for for Apple in that, that respect. Sure, sure. Now, uh, maybe shifting away from the consumer side of things a little bit uh, towards the acquisition front, because everybody's buying companies these days. Apple uh, is no stranger to that. They just reportedly snapped up SpotSetter. It's a search engine that analyzes friends' recommendations and reviews in social space and then puts that big data <laughs> to work by offering up tailor-made recommendations on places to go, among other things. Um, how might this service be of use to Apple's current offerings? What do you see them doing with this uh, acquisition? Well, I think the story you're scrolling there from TechCrunch even says um, this acquisition is mainly for the technology mm -hmm. and the employee. So I don't know that you're going to see, you know, Apple Setter or any right. sort of service right. like that anytime soon. Um, what I found interesting about this is that if you look at um, what what Apple does, particularly with Siri, uh, is that it, there's not a lot of what you might call anticipatory computing or personalization on the fly where the phone learns about you and then offers you information that it thinks you'll you'll be interested in. Um, this is the sort of thing Google has started doing uh, a while back with Google Now. Yes. And yes. Uh, my suspicion is that Spot Setter is probably going to feed into um, an Apple offering that will be anticipatory in some respect. Um, exactly how it'll work, who knows? I mean. It's really, it strikes me as really unlikely that it's going to take the spot setter approach where you sign up, um, sign into it with all your social accounts and it you pulls in all this information and then personalizes from that. Um, Apple is really um, careful with its users' privacy uh, in a way that, I mean, it, it really emphasizes. And that might be pushing the boundaries with its users a little bit. Um, but I do think it's going to be doing its best to. To, to try to take that next step. And instead of uh, answering your questions, and again, I, I mentioned Siri because it seems like the most likely place that yes. they, they could use this. Um, but so instead of Siri just answering your questions, um, you know, she would, she would anticipate sort of where you're going. Um, the, the tricky thing for me is, is how, how would this look different from something like Google Now? Google Now already sort of anticipates, I mean, how long will it take you to get home? You've got a meeting coming up, you need to leave now, things like that. Um, if Apple can really come up with something that uh, notifies people on the fly of interesting things around them in a way that, as, as the spot setter founders were talking about, um, you know, it seems like magic. You look at your wrist, it provides you information, and you get back to your real life and stop thinking about technology, then that, that's the sort of thing that could be a selling point for uh, something like an iWatch. Um, but this is all 
really, really speculative. Absolutely it is, and that's why it's fun. <laughs> All right, David Hamilton, thank you so much for joining me to talk about a few uh, stories that are kind of circulating around Apple right now. I really appreciate it. Um, where can people find your work online? Uh, you can find us at readwrite.com. All right, and uh, do you have a Twitter handle? Can people find you on Twitter? Sure. Um, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of ungainly. It's David underscore Hamilton. All right. Well, that's not too bad. A little See underscore it. never hurt anybody. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, David. Appreciate it. Thanks, Chase. All righty. Uh, and finally, the United States Central Intelligence Agency, that's the CIA, has officially launched its Twitter presence with a tweet that appropriately reads, quote, we can neither confirm nor deny that this is our first tweet, end quote. The CIA joins other government agencies like uh, the National Security Agency and the Director of National Intelligence on the social media service and appears to be a hit so far. I know I subscribed to it. Within an hour of, of that first published tweet, at CIA had already gained 85,200 followers and the tweet had been retweeted 70,000 times. They're doing something right. Agency spokesman Deanne Boyd, or De Dean Boyd, more like it, explains that the delay was due to the agency having to file a complaint against a Twitter user who had already grabbed the at CIA username. There was someone out there impersonating CIA via Twitter, said Mr. Boyd. A CIA filed an impersonation complaint with Twitter, and they secured the at CIA account for us, which is routine for government agencies. End quote. There you have it. Go subscribe. That's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to this show at twit.tv slash tn2, and you can write us at tn2 at twit.tv. Do not miss our morning news program. I'm here five days a week producing that with Mike Elgin. It's Tech News Today, Monday and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. And that's, uh, that's all she wrote. I'm Jason Howell. Thank you so much for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.